Christine Stewart of Connecticut News Junkie and The Current's Chris Keating are back to continue our money talk with Pete Joya. He is the vice president of the Connecticut Business and Industry Association. And as much as anyone, he's been watching and waiting to see what the state's new budget will look like and how it could affect jobs, development, and business overall. Pete, thanks for joining us. So were you cringing nice when... Uh, Senate President was talking about taking back tax spending and looking at tax exemptions and that kind of thing? Well, you know, I think that everything is going to get looked at in this budget cycle. There's no doubt about it. I mean, when you have a $3.5 billion problem, we expect everything to be looked at. Mm -hmm. But I think that uh, when you're trying to solve this problem, it's essential to do it with the least amount of tax increase and to be careful if you have tax increases in it as to what you're going to be dealing with. Because the key thing that we want to do here is we want to grow the economy. We want to have investment stay in Connecticut and come into Connecticut and create jobs with that. Mm -hmm. And jobs is part of the bottom line, and, and certainly the state budget has got to help that, not hurt it. You're, you're a bit of a tax authority, and, and uh, the relationship between tax increases and job creation or not job creation. Uh, w what do you envision? Are, are there any tax increases that uh, CBIA could support or, or that you could support vis-a-vis uh, -vis job creation? Well... <laughs> Yeah, tax increases don't add jobs. Yeah, so that's, that's, a, that's, a bottom, that's a bottom line thing. I think, I think we'll be taking a look at what uh, will be coming out of the uh, Governor Malloy's budget and see, uh, and see how they're dealing with, in particular, uh, things such as uh, adjustments in the state agencies, uh, consolidations. I know he talked about in some of his opening remarks. Uh, the other day, uh, certainly I, I think we're going to be looking at what they're going to be doing for efficiencies, uh, what they're going to be doing in terms of some of the commission findings, mm -hmm. such as the Commission on Enhancing Agency Outcomes. And uh, we've talked with him about uh, uh, the Connecticut Institute studies that have been done on, on various issues. And, you know, we think that that's what's going to be looked at first. And you've, you've got to start there, especially if you're going to start with the idea of enhancing a business climate and having businesses want to stay here, grow here, and add jobs. But, 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 but would you agree that part of the package, then when the smoke clears, that there will be tax increases I, this year, I or do you not concede that? I, I, I think that, uh, you know, the, the governor was very clear on, on that in his, uh, in his campaign, that he wasn't going to rule out tax increases. So uh, with $3.5 billion, uh, I think that the potential is definitely there. What did you think about when he mentioned in his uh, speech to the General Assembly, uh, he said something, you know, about the state being business unfriendly? Well, that's an actual fact. There have been study after study that have been done by independent groups that have looked at the all, all 50 states that have said that Connecticut is anywhere from you know, the 10th the, the most unfriendly to the most unfriendly in, in various aspects. And that has been the case for year after year. So you know, all he's doing there is, is acknowledging a fact. I think it's important that he acknowledged it. And obviously he did that because he wants to change it. And we're certainly willing to do everything we can to work with him to help him change that. Is there anything that the state can do um, that doesn't cost any money to improve employer confidence? Sure. Well, I, I mean, sometimes well, it's just a perception I mean, issue. That part of it is just a perception issue. Part, you know, what, what could they do that doesn't cost any money? They could, they could uh, meet uh, and say, you know, we're not going to pass any uh, new regulatory measures uh, until um, until uh, we, you know we pass a budget and. We're going to review all those for whether or not they, they may be acceptable or not to, to the uh, business community. So there's lots of things that they could do that, that don't cost money. Uh, and a lot of the things that they could do with the agencies could, could, actually, could actually save money. And you know, I think that they've got to, got to, to look at those uh, activities, both in terms of what the agency, how the agencies function, and how various programs function. What tax do um, businesses look at the most? Do they look at the property tax, the corporate tax? Um, you know, do they look at income taxes when they're thinking well, about you know, relocating? I think every the size business is concerned about the corporate tax, mm -hmm. and, and, and there's a reason for that. Because if you're a small business person, the potential that that a larger business that is incorporated is a mm -hmm. customer of yours mm -hmm. is very much there. I mean, you know, you think of, of large companies like like UTC. They have, they have hundreds and hundreds of subcontractors that are within the state that, 
in many cases, you know, they're a principal customer. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and if you have a, a company like that that doesn't want to expand within the state, it's going to affect the subcontractors as well. So I think that's a key one. Certainly the property tax is, is, is a huge issue for business. And then if you're an unincorporated business, you're an S-Corp or a mm -hmm. pass-through entity, the income tax is important because you, you, know, you don't pay corporate tax, but you sure pay a heck of a lot of, of uh, personal income tax. Mm -hmm. And also in this concept, we asked Don Williams a couple of minutes ago, the concept of shared sacrifice. Um, what are your thoughts on, on shared sacrifice? Do you consider the business community uh, in that boat as, as part of uh, somebody who's going to have to participate in the shared sacrifice? Well, you know, and, the business and how community would that work? is already participating enormously in shared sacrifice, just in you know, what we've gone through with the, with the, uh, um, with the, uh, the problems in the state and the amount of unemployment. I mean, unemployment taxes alone in businesses have gone up $500 million during mm -hmm. the recession al al already. So there's, there's a lot of sacrifice that, that, that's already out there. And I think that the, the key thing that, they, that they've got to do when they, when, they craft, when they craft this budget document is they've got to say, gee, how, how, do, we, how do we do this so that we ha have a situation where, where businesses will look in, in the future with more confidence to the state and actually want to start investing in the state and adding jobs? Because, it, because we will have a solid recovery. And maybe it will come in late 2011, maybe 2012, 2013. Mm -hmm. Businesses will have money to invest at, at, at that time. Now, they can invest it here, or they can invest it in Texas, or they can invest it in Singapore. And what we've got to, to do is create a climate where the businesses say, hey, if we're going to do the expansion, we want to do it here. Mm -hmm. And that won't always be the case because they may have customers they have to serve in those other areas. They, they may have to do something to establish a presence in those other areas. They may need to have some production in some other areas to bring it back to Connecticut so that they can be cost competitive in a global marketplace. But the key thing is they've got to be in a situation where they want to make that investment in Connecticut. They feel it's going to be a safe investment, that it's going to be a good investment, and it's going to be something that they're going to get a return on investment from. And what we've he been hearing about with all of this business unfriendliness is that a lot of people have not had confidence in, in that within, within the state. And that's one of the reasons why we're not, we're not doing as well as we could be. Right. Well, we know you will be watching diligently, and we thank you for taking time to tell us about it. Okay, today. thank you. Thanks a lot. Ahead, we're going to take a look back at the celebration before the work for the governor and the legislature begins. legislative session has started and so the wrangling begins. The Senate president is here to tell us what's in store as lawmakers battle the budget. Also, we have an economist from the Connecticut Business and Industry Association here to talk dollars and cents and help prepare us for how the state's budget might affect our own. And we're going to take a look back at the inauguration of the new governor, the celebration before the work. You're watching The Real Story. I'm Lori Perez. It is a new day with a new governor and perhaps a new approach to the state's looming $3.5 billion budget deficit. Here to talk about the budget battle ahead and other issues that might be tackled in the session is reporter Christine Seward of CT News Junkie, Senate President Donald Williams, and Chris Keating, the current Capitol Bureau Chief. Thanks all for being here. Senator, if you could talk to us, uh, just give your reaction to um, the tone that was set by Governor Malloy. You know, I thought he set exactly the right tone. Uh, everybody knows that across the country right now we're facing the worst fiscal times of our lifetime. The economic recession has not abated. We have no recovery on Main Street in Connecticut or across the country. Uh, Dan Malloy is out there now talking about the, the real problems, the actual depth of the crisis for the state of Connecticut. He's not mincing words about it, and he wants to lead us out not only by tackling the budget problem, but also talking about the need to get back on track for the economy, start creating jobs again. Was there anything, um, I know he hasn't released a lot of details, and, and the devil will be in those details, but was there anything surprising to you or alarming? 
<laughs> no, I'll tell you, not surprising, not alarming, refreshing is what I would say. Uh, two years ago, we spent the entire session trying to get agreement uh, with the governor as to the true depth of the deficit. And we found that folks were ignoring about two and a half billion dollars worth of the deficit. We have a governor now who's saying, you know what, I want to face up to the challenges right from the first day. He wants to have transparency in terms of the governing process, the accounting of the deficit, and he's ready to roll up his sleeves. He's saying, you know what, Democrats, Republicans, let's work together on these very, very tough challenges. And with that new accounting, uh, he the suggestion is that the budget deficit that we know of will grow, increase. That's right. Chris? Part of, part of the, uh, what uh, Dan Moy keeps talking about is shared sacrifice. I wanted to know what is your definition of shared sacrifice, and does that include more concessions by state employees? You know, my definition of shared sacrifice is looking at every area of state spending, every agency, every department, every constituency that depends on the state for funding, and for each one of those entities to look at every dollar they spend and figure out ways to save money, have greater efficiency. You know, we've got to be frank with folks. At this point, there's just not enough revenue coming in to take care of all of the spending that's gone on in the past. The economic downturn has hurt Connecticut and 49 other states in that same way. So we have to change. We have to change because at the end of the day, the budget has to be balanced. We have to have a pathway to economic recovery and still have the ability to give a hand up to those people who have been hurt the most by the economic recession. And would, would you say that means that nobody should expect an increase? No agency, no department, nobody should expect an increase? You know, all that is yet to be determined in terms of, you're talking specifically about state employees, but I would go beyond that and talk about each one of our programs, the services, the layers of bureaucracy, uh, all of that is going to be on the table. He was a little critical earlier this week um, saying that the budget that the Democrats had passed uh, basically thought that revenues would increase and that the economy would return to normal, and it hasn't. And he said you guys should have known that. Is, is that fair of him to criticize? You know, I, I think that is fair criticism. Uh, you know, if you do go back, though, to 1991, the last big economic downturn, or 2001, the next in line in terms of a serious recession, two years after the fact, there was a recovery. We did see the economic trends coming back. We did see the creation of jobs and revenue coming back. This recession is the worst of our lifetime, the worst, many people say, since the Great Depression. Uh, and we're not out of it now, and we won't be in the future. And if Connecticut looked at a quicker recovery than actually happened based on recessions of the past, you know, 49 other states pretty much did the same thing. Now we have to adjust. The, the recovery is coming more slowly than folks want or than they predicted. So now we have to adjust to that economic reality. Is that frustrating? You finally have a Democratic governor and you have all these ideas and, 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 and policies you wanted to implement for so long and now's your chance to do it and now you have this this economy and it's possible that you won't be able to? You know, sure, Christina, at one level it is very frustrating that in these tough economic times uh, we're really up against the wall and it's the first time in 20 years that we have a Democratic governor and a Democratic legislature. Uh, looking at it in another way, I would not want it any other way because in the, this time of, of the worst challenge that, that we face, we need all hands on deck. We need a government that is pulling in the same direction. And now for the first time in 20 years, you have a governor and a legislature coming from the same place in terms of values and principles. And these are the values and principles that the vast majority of the people of Connecticut share. That's why we have strong majorities in the legislature. That's why we have a Democratic governor. And the people of Connecticut are now counting on us. Uh, to face up to these challenges, which Governor Malloy is doing, and to address them and to solve them. Do you think that prior efforts to um, reduce spending throughout uh, agencies across the state and programs across the state have not been um, thorough enough or realistic enough, or what has it been? I don't think they've been comprehensive enough, and I think that they've been done in an adversarial way. And here's a, a chance where I think that that we can make a difference because with a Democratic governor and a Democratic legislature, uh, you've already seen Governor Malloy talk about inviting 
uh, the labor folks, the state employees, to the table, not as adversaries, not as folks to be punished, but as folks to put their ideas on the table. You know, over the years, I've met with state employees who work in the trenches out across the state. They have their own stories about, like, the U.S. Defense Department, the $1,000 toilet seat or the $500 hammer, money that's wasted by the state of Connecticut, and they say that their ideas have not been implemented or utilized. That's going to change. We need everybody at the table understanding it is, as Governor Malloy said, time for shared sacrifice. Well, so does, does the shared sacrifice, if it is actually shared and it is fair and it is on everyone, does that mean a tax increase on everyone? That remains to be seen as well, but again, Governor Malloy, to his credit, has not ruled anything in or out. He says that, you know, you can't cut your way 100% out of this or you can't tax your way 100% out of it. I do know that we have far too many uh, tax expenditures, tax spending, the, 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 the loopholes, the subsidies, the breaks for the special interests that get put on the books over the years and never get scrutinized again. It's time to put that 4 or $5 billion worth of subsidies and loopholes on the table and make folks justify those, make them prove that they contribute to our economy. And if they don't, let's get rid of them. And has there just been no will to get rid of those in the past? Why, why are they still there? It's full employment for uh, the lobbyists, quite frankly. Uh, every one of those special breaks and special interests uh, has advocates and lobbyists who come to fight for it. But again, this is a time of shared sacrifice. And now, more than ever, is the time to put those on the table and force folks to justify them, to, to prove that they actually preserve or create jobs. As a leader of the Democratic Party, are you concerned Governor Malloy took um, several lawmakers from the legislature, so there will be uh, nine, possibly ten, if Representative Leon runs for Andrew McDonald's seat, open seats. Um, are you looking at retaining those? Uh, of course. Well, I, I mean, are you worried about losing any? Are, are you worried? You know, in special election, not many people turn out. Republicans, you know, do have a good shot at some of those seats based on the districts. Well, first of all, let me say I'm thrilled that in the state senate we have Don DeFranzo, who will be serving in the Malloy administration, Andrew McDonald serving in the Malloy administration. These are terrific people, uh, knowledgeable public servants, and they're going to help in all, meeting all these challenges we've been talking about. But you're right; it means in the short term, as we're working on the budget and these other issues, we'll have special elections in the Senate and the House. Uh, it, it just means that we've got to meet those challenges as well, and we will. Are you looking forward to it or uh, kind of trepidatious about the beginning or what? No, I, I've been anxious to get started. You know, yesterday was a great day, but I talked with a number of folks uh, in the Malloy administration as well as our own legislators, and the feeling was kind of mutual. You know, we've all been waiting to really dive into this. Uh, the budget's uh, due uh, in the latter half of uh, February. We know that these challenges are just tremendous. Uh, so I think you've got a lot of people who are wound up and ready to go, and as of today, that's what's happening. All right, well, we wish you good luck. Thanks for stopping Thank you, by. Up next, Money Talk with business advocate and economist Pete Joya. Inauguration Day was a day filled with celebration and optimism. The first order of business was the inaugural parade through downtown Hartford. The short procession started at the Soldiers and Sailors Arch, continued past the Capitol, and onto the State Armory for Dan Malloy's swearing-in ceremony. And when the parade ended, the pomp and circumstance moved inside the State Armory. That's where Governor Malloy took the oath of office. Fox Connecticut's John Charlton has more on his first speech as Connecticut's new governor. The duties of the office of governor, to the best of your abilities, so help you God. I do. <laughs> Emphatically sworn in as Connecticut's 88th governor, Dan Malloy took the podium at the armory knowing he was in for a tough fight. Today I see an economic crisis, an employment crisis, both fueled by unfriendly employer environment, a lack of educational resources, a deteriorating transportation system, and an enormous budget crisis of historic proportions all coddled by a habit of political sugarcoating that has passed our problems on to the next generation. Well, ladies and gentlemen, the next generation is here.
The first Democrat to head the state's executive branch in 20 years, Governor Malloy pledged to work across party lines to turn things around in Connecticut. Most importantly, we will need to solve our problems together by pursuing with great urgency not Republican ideas or Democratic ideas, but good ideas that know no political master or agenda. Malloy also took the opportunity to recognize the very popular woman he was replacing. Governor Rell stepped into the role of governor at a time when our state was in a different kind of crisis, a crisis of confidence in the character and intentions of its leadership. She worked tirelessly to restore that sense of respectability, and she will hold a special place in our hearts because of her efforts. Malloy thanked Governor Rell for leaving her office a better place. Malloy vows that's his mission now for the entire state. I believe the people of Connecticut are willing to make sacrifices. If shared sacrifice really is shared, that we understand where we are going and that it is a, it, that it is a sacrifice with a purpose. At this crossroads of crisis and opportunity, I believe we will hold fast to our heritage while we reach deep rally hard, and choose to leave Connecticut a better place. John Charlton, Fox, Connecticut. Governor Malloy has said closing the budget gap is his first priority. He set the tone as he addressed the General Assembly moments after taking office. Welcomed with a standing ovation, Governor Dan Malloy addressed the joint session of the General Assembly with a message of optimism and realism. We are indeed at a crossroads of crisis and opportunity. We will, need re we will need to reach deep to our roots, those of strength, yet compassion, steadfastness, yes, yet innovation. Crisis and opportunity are meeting all right. Some might say at a toll booth asking for $3.5 billion to move on. To that, the new governor says Connecticut will compete for lucrative biotech and stem cell research jobs. That Connecticut will develop its three deep water ports to spark commercial activity and will make Bradley International Airport an independent entity. Ideas that cross political parties. Malloy posed questions today, urging lawmakers to look for the answers, suggesting that what they find will bring them together. Future generations will look back on this particular crossroads of crisis and opportunity and say that we rallied, that we reached deep. We chose well to leave this great state better than we found it. After all, we know as, a, uh, as the people of Connecticut, it is in our nature to do so. Party leaders are for now playing nice, agreeing at least to the concept of shared sacrifice, but asking questions of their own. We could all agree about shared sacrifice. The question is, how does one define shared sacrifice? There are a lot of people who say in the last go-round there was three prongs, uh, three legs to the stool. There was borrowing. There was... Uh, tax increases. Let's start with a tax spending that doesn't contribute to jobs. Those special tax breaks and expenditures that special interests got on the books over the last 50 years and no one ever went back to check to see if they were still contributing to jobs. Those types of tax expenditures and loopholes need to go and there are billions of dollars of those particular tax expenditures. At the Capitol, Lori Perez, Fox Connecticut News. But before the work begins, a party, a black tie only party at the convention center in Hartford that got some criticism from people confused about Malloy's message of shared sacrifice and then hosting a black tie party. But nonetheless, a good time had by all who attended. Fox Connecticut's Narmin Chaudhary was there. Complete with a red carpet, women were dazzling in floor-length gowns and were escorted by members of Connecticut's Honor Guard. Men were dressed to the nines as the Connecticut Convention Center was transformed for the 2011 inaugural ball. It's special because it's been so long since a Democrat's been elected governor, and it's just a celebration. It's very exciting. It's a new beginning. At a cost of $175 a ticket, the drinks flowed, the crowd mingled before the ceremonies got underway way to celebrate a new Democratic governor to office for the first time in more than 20 years. I've had the pleasure of working with Dan Malloy down in Stanford for over 10 years now, and so I wouldn't have missed this. We're diehard Democrats. We've been Democrats all our lives, both our parents, our families. Um, we've been, we're business people. We, you know, uh, we want to see good government. While no public money was used for the inaugural ball, the cost of the $300,000 bash in a time the state faces a serious financial crisis is hard to ignore. Many in the room acknowledging the difficult road ahead for state lawmakers. The state has a lot of problems. We all know it. And 
I think we have a man who's committed to doing his best to fix them and get us back to where we belong. But for now, it's a celebration. Well, we'll get the hard work done, but tonight is celebrating. Yes, I'm sure that they do have it in the back of their minds, but it is a celebratory time. I think you have to enjoy the evening. It's probably going to be the last fun uh, day they're going to have till probably sometime in July. And he said that right. It could be among the last time politicians are smiling so much with so much. Uh, lots of hard work ahead. Don't forget, if you missed something here on The Real Story, you can now watch it online by going to ctnow.com. You can also catch us on YouTube. Thanks for watching this week's edition of The Real Story. We'll see you here again next week. Audrey Kuchin, Fox, Connecticut. Logan, over to you. Audrey, thanks. The news came out just this week. The British Medical Journal saying that a landmark study linking autism to childhood vaccinations was all a lie, a fraud. But the doctor behind the study says he is sticking by his research. Dr. Andrew Wakefield's 1998 study panicked many parents, causing a lot of them not to vaccinate their children as a result. And the debate continues as many doctors are saying that they agree with the journal. But some parents are still skeptical. So this morning, I'm joined by pediatric Dr. Fred Bogan of St. Francis Hospital. Good to see you, doctor. Thanks so much. Good to see you, my what was your thought when you first heard that this earlier study was just a fraud, that it just was completely made up? Well, the, the degree of the falsified data was pretty shocking. It, mm -hmm. It's not, fortunately, it's not a common event, I would say. And, but it didn't, it didn't really change things that much in that the science was always very weak at best. And there has been a great deal of work since that study in 98 that really completely uh, refuted it. Is there any way that these measles, these chickenpox vaccinations could cause or at least contribute to the cause of autism? Well, that's been looked at in at least eight or nine very large epidemiologic studies, Denmark, Finland, Canada, UK, the US, people have looked very, very carefully at large populations of children and have literally found no evidence to connect the vaccines with autism. What do you say to these parents who are skeptical? It's now just been ingrained in their mind that these vaccinations cause autism and they, of course, don't want to get it for their kids. What do you tell them? Well, I, I think one problem is the difference between two things happening at the same time and two things being causally related, that one thing causes the other. So it's not surprising. I, I understand where parents are coming from. We, we tend to give the MMR vaccine at tw between 12 and 15 months. We tend to see children diagnosed and showing the symptoms of autism between 12 and 24 months. Mm -hmm. So there's great overlap, and, and it, it would be easy to see a number of kids statistically that develop their symptoms or were diagnosed shortly after that vaccine. So one adds two and two together. And, sure. And, and it looks like it caused it, perhaps. Exactly. And then you have that earlier study, and you say, aha, obviously that's what happened. Right. What do you tell parents who didn't have their kids vaccinated uh, way back when? Do they do it now, or is it too late? Yeah. No, it's not, it's not too late, and I would certainly encourage par parents to look at it again, and I would encourage them to, to go ahead with the vaccines. Um, I tell parents every day I vaccinated my own children and I would do it if they were young again today. Now this report only looked at the measles and chicken pox vaccinations, is that right? Or did it look at all vaccinations no matter what? Well, no, it was the, it was the MMR, the measles, mumps, and Ru German measles, okay. rubella. And, uh, and that was the, the claim that, or the implication of that old flawed, and now we know falsified study. Are there some risks to just getting those vaccinations aside from now we know this isn't a risk for autism, but are there other risks yeah. associated with it? There are. I, I would be dishonest if I said there are no risks to the vaccines. There, there certainly are, and we discuss those with parents. But in my experience, and, and the data will bear out, the, the risks um, are far outweighed by the benefits of the vaccines. Okay. We're going to let you go because you're going to help us with a web chat coming up right now in just a few minutes. You can log on to ctnow.com. It's a live web chat with Dr. Bogan. He's going to be answering all of your questions online from now until 9 o'clock this morning. So you've got about 50 minutes to do that. So, Doctor, thanks for coming in. Thank you. We'll let you get over to the computer again, ctnow.com. We appreciate your time. Sarah, over to you. Thanks, guys. He's on the move. <laughs> up next on the Fox Connecticut Morning News, some major controversy continues. 
over a new publication of one of Mark Twain's classics. We'll talk to an expert about the new book. Plus, Kurt, the cyber guy is always showing us the coolest tech gadgets, and he's got them from Las Vegas. We'll chat with him coming up as well. And right now, a little bit of light snow going across the western one half of the state. Eastern areas, you had some light snow at the moment. It has stopped, but we're watching the heavier band set up to our west. I'll tell you when that moves in. Winter weather advisory in effect till tonight.